Welcome to Arts in the City. I'm Magali Laguerre Wilkinson at the National Museum of the American Indian, where you'll find Native American art and objects going back thousands of years. Currently, the museum is presenting the Native Fashion Now exhibit. It's Native American fashion like you've never seen before. Native Fashion Now is an exhibition celebrating the incredible depth and breadth of contemporary Native fashion created by artists from the United States and Canada, from dozens and dozens of tribal communities. Karen Kramer is the curator of Native Fashion Now, which originated at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. It has traveled around the country, and fittingly, New York City, a fashion capital of the world, is its last stop. It's really an exhibition that unpacks the exciting realms of contemporary native fashion, where art meets fashion, politics, and identity. From the 1950s until today. The exhibition opens with the Pathbreakers, native designers who have broken ground with their new, or let's say renewed vision of native fashion. What better person to start with than Patricia Michaels, who brought a wide audience to native-inspired fashion by being a finalist on season 11 of the show Project Runway. Take in her sleek cityscape dress featured in the show, her handmade parasols, and videos of her work. It shows this holistic vision that Patricia has where she marries her Taos Pueblo worldview with a very modern aesthetic. David and Wayne Nez Goussan's postmodern boa also takes fashion to another level. It is this incredible stainless steel and copper boa that is equipped with feathers that is pushing the envelope on materials and form and what you think native fashion is. Next, we meet the revisitors who refresh, renew, and expand on tradition. Tony Williams fuses Japanese and Native American designs, while Dallin Maybe applies Native motifs on a silk and steel corset and skirt. Margaret Wood creates the modern interpretation of the Navajo blanket dress. Wood was ahead of her time, writing Native American fashion in 1981. Well, I have always said that the Native American women were fabulous artists and craftspeople. I know when the Indian women first saw the first European visitors, I'm sure two of them were standing behind a bush wondering, I wonder if we could get some of those buttons, or they didn't even know what they were, but they knew they were shiny and they thought I could put them on my dress or my skirt. So we were no different then than fashion people are now, really, looking for the new thing. The next new thing can certainly be seen in the section on activators, who merge streetwear with personal style and activism like Jared Yazzie. Jared Yazzie's t-shirt packs quite a punch with four words, Native Americans discovered Columbus. With those four short words, he's really turning history on its head and making us think deeper and look deeper at a really important part of history that we've been told wrongly for dozens and dozens of years. The exhibition ends with the provocateurs, who push the boundaries between art and fashion. Shosho Esquiro, a Casca Dene artist from the Yukon of Alaska, dreamed up this knockout ensemble out of carp skin, animal fur, rooster feathers, and skull. It walked down the runway, but it has a lot of meaning. She created this dress as a part of her Day of the Dead collection, a celebration in Mexico whereby families reimagine a reunion with a departed loved one. So it's a real homage to people that she loves who, is past, who have passed on. Finally, don't miss Carla Hemlock's one-of-a-kind artwork, the treaty cloth shirt. This artist sums up the exhibition best. When it's a native fashion now, it's always been there. It's always been there. And for whatever reason, uh, people didn't see it. And if they don't see it now, I mean, if you look at a lot of the designers you go through, they are a force. They are an incredible force. Native Fashion Now runs through September 4th. 
Finding love and romance is a subject in innumerable TV shows, plays, and movies. But in the new Broadway comedy, Significant Other, Cupid is replaced by social media. Pat Collins heads to the Great White Way to see how romance blooms in the digital age. Don't do it, Jordan. Just don't hit set. Jordan Berman, a gay single 20-something New Yorker, played by Gideon Glick, turns to social media in an attempt to find Mr. Right, or at least the right guy to meet for coffee. His three female best friends are now married, and to his dismay, living different lives. Feels like all my friends are dying. <laughs> This play really zooms in on, on what loneliness can do to a person and, and how you navigate that. Jordan fantasizes about a romance with a handsome fellow employee who has no interest in being anything more than an office buddy. It seems like I think the thing that is so difficult for so many people is that, um, is that it feels like finally you you find somebody you want to be with, and that person doesn't feel that way about you. And I just wanted to say how much I like spending time with you, and to see if maybe you wanted to spend some more time with me outside the office to keep getting to know each other. He's 29, like, there's so much more left. Like, it's not a big deal that nobody, you know, it's not a huge deal that nobody's told you they love you yet. May I help you? Yes, our friend is getting married. How do the characters in your play differ from the characters in Sex and the City in terms of finding a significant other? There was an online component to it, um, which has kind of changed the whole landscape. Our show is not about a particular topic. Our play is groundbreaking in the sense that it's about something that doesn't feel totally tangible, which is friendship. This is truly the, the theme of the entire play. Sex in the City was about the four girls finding somebody and, and or not even wanting. And you have a Samantha who didn't really even care about intimacy, but was more about sex. Here, though, it's about them finding their significant other and one being left behind. And I think it gets harder and harder as the play goes on and he starts to not really see the world so clearly because he is, he is in so much pain. I'm everything I am because you love me. As the gay male best friend at the center of the plot, Jordan differs from Rupert Everett's character in the 1997 film My Best Friend's Wedding and from Eric McCormick's Will Truman in Will and Grace. I am the gay best friend of these three, three ladies, but I think we're playing with a trope just in the sense that usually it's about the lady and it's the gay best friend has a quip here and there, but here the center is about the gay best friend and, and his search for love. Have you eaten yet? I did, yeah, but if you No, did, I did, but I was thinking maybe if you wanted to get a drink or something. Jordan, the character I play, he becomes fixated on men and he kind of forms relationships with them through fantasy and that's through looking at their Facebook profile and there's a lot of accessibility and but it can be a little alienating. There's a lot of fantasy involved. You, you kind of project what you want onto that person without really getting to know that person. Get up from the laptop and walk away. Just get up from the laptop and step away, step away from the laptop. The play, written by Joshua Harmon and directed by Trip Cullman, draws an eclectic audience from middle-aged theatergoers to millennials who put away their smartphones for two hours. I would be hard-pressed to find someone, anyone who doesn't relate to it, but particularly someone in their 20s and 30s living in New York City who doesn't feel like they're they see themselves up there in some capacity. We're not feeling exactly feelings that only millennials feel. I think this idea of loneliness and wanting to find someone is very universal. I think sometimes we have to just take a risk and put ourselves out there because if we don't, we'll live to regret that we never tried for something that could have been incredible, but we'll never know because we didn't even make the effort to try. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City. The weather's finally changing, so now's the time to stock up on that summer beach reading. Lisa Beth Kovitz sits down with Little Brown's newest author, Jamie Brenner. A great summer read can transport you out of the dirt and grit of the city into a world of endless beaches and fabulous sunsets. The Forever Summer is a time when three generations of women come together, secrets are uncovered, and their family and their lives change for the better. But all change comes with some struggle and some work. 
So where does a great story like that come from? I learned that ancestry research and genealogy is the second largest hobby in the country now, second only to gardening. And while it's really interesting and fun, a lot of people are making discoveries that they maybe didn't expect and don't know how to deal with. A very close friend of mine told me that she was researching her family history and made a very big discovery that her father who raised her was not actually her biological father. And she had to not only change the way maybe she thought about herself and who she was, but what it meant to be a daughter, what it meant to be a part of something larger. You have two other novels that did very well, but moving to Little Brown is a big step in your career. Little Brown is a dream publisher. They've published my favorite novels over the past few years, and I think what Little Brown does really well is they understand who the author is trying to reach, and they package the book in a way that's easy for the reader to find and for the author is such a great reflection of what they're trying to convey in the work. For example, Maria Semple who wrote Where'd You Go Bernadette? That was such an iconic cover and it conveyed kind of the quirky, brilliant character of the writing. Or with Ellen Hildebrand, you know, she has beach covers and I know every time I read one of her books I'm going to get lost in a vacation somewhere and I really wanted that type of um, strong messaging for the books that I write because for me as a reader it's something that's very important. Books, of course, written by writers, but how does a publisher shape a novel? You may have an idea of, of your story, but they're really responsible for visually conveying that to the readership. And on a more micro level, the editor is really your stopgap. You write the book, maybe your agent or a secondary reader gives you feedback, but the editor is going to be the one that makes sure it is in the absolute best shape before it sees the light of day. And what advice does Brenner have for a writer just starting out? I always wanted to be a writer, but I didn't think it was possible because I thought books just were these perfect things that these brilliant people produced. And I actually spent some time working in publishing, many years working in publishing, and I realized that there's no perfect writer and there's no perfect book, that really what it takes is just hard work and really wanting to make it happen and willing to do it badly. And once I saw that, I saw that in other writers, I saw that through the eyes of publishers, I finally had the nerve to be imperfect myself, and that was the first step towards creating something that was worth reading. What's next for you? Next, I have a book coming out um, next spring called The Husband Hour, which is about a war widow who tries to kind of have a reclusive life, goes into hiding, and a documentary filmmaker finds her trying to tell the story of her husband's life and death and forces her to really look at what happened in his life and in their marriage. So that's coming out spring of 18. Jamie, thank you so much for spending time with us for Arts in the City. This has been Lisa Beth Kovetz. For decades, black designers have made huge contributions to the world of fashion. Now, that work can be seen in one place. Mike Gilliam reports. One of the most interesting exhibits in the city is currently on display at a museum you might not be familiar with. It focuses on black designers and is currently at the museum at FIT. Black designers have had a huge contribution to the fashion industry, to fashion over time, but a lot of those times those stories have been left out of the fashion narrative. And so we really wanted to take this opportunity to look at individual designers, what they were creating in their different eras, and reweave those stories back into the whole. To accomplish that mission, different displays are set up throughout the gallery, showing various fashion eras. You're going to see a range of fashion created by black designers from the 1950s all the way to the present. And we have some really beautiful, outstanding examples of fashion in different categories from different time periods. For example, here in our introductory gallery, we have this beautiful wedding gown by Anne Lowe. Anne Lowe is one of the earliest designers that we have featured. Um, she's most well known for making Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress, but she was a really popular um, society dressmaker in the 1950s here in New York City. She made dresses for DuPont and Rockefellers and Rothschilds. Way says Lowe was referred to as society's best kept secret. Another area is entitled Breaking into the Industry. Ariel Alaya is co-curator. 
We have some lovely pieces from Zelda Wynn Valdez, who had won the commission to produce the Playboy Bunny uniform. And from there, she'd also created a lovely evening wear pieces, very sexy for Josephine Baker, Ella Fitzgerald, and many other performers. Just a few steps away, the focus shifts to the rising stars of the 1970s. Black designers really had a moment um, in the 1970s when they really started to be recognized nationally by the press, both the mainstream press and the fashion press. So we have designers like Stephen Burroughs and Scott Berry and Fabrice, and these designers had a national clientele, and this is really the first time that we see this happening in the 20th century. And they were really part of the disco era in fashion that went right along with the disco era in music. So these soft, body-conscious silhouettes, things that would be right at home at Studio 54. And these designers were really important with a lot of other American designers in helping to establish New York as a fashion capital at this time. Many of the evening wear pieces go hand in hand with the music industry. One of the star pieces, I would say, is a beautiful CD green piece covered in Swarovski crystals. He'd originally created it for Tina Turner on her Wildest Dreams tour because she said she was disappearing on stage and needed something that would really make her sparkle. Uh, that style of dress he's created also for many uh, different things like Sex in the City and also for Mariah Carey, which she constantly wears on tour. to take a look at some black fashion designers who are really taking a nuanced look at specific inspiration from Africa. For example, we have a piece by Patrick Kelly here, um, and he's looking at kente cloth. So kente cloth comes from the area around Ghana, and it's a strip woven um, textile that goes back hundreds of years. Here he's reinterpreted that woven pattern into a print. Not all of the exhibit is made up of gowns and women's clothing. You'll also see menswear. We have a whole platform dedicated to menswear, and then you also see it sprinkled throughout the exhibition, especially in the street influence section. Pieces from Dapper Dan of Harlem, who is known to create these very kind of absurd, outlandish things for different hip hop artists and even people like Mike Tyson. There's a lot to see, including the Sean Jean line and familiar looks from the runway, like those created by designers associated with Kanye West. And you can catch the exhibit here at the museum at FIT from now through May 16th. I'm Mike Gilliam for Arts in the City. What's a Southern politician to do when God and guns collide? Donna Hanover says audiences at the New World stages are finding out in the new play, Church and State. Prayer is not the answer. Staying quiet out of respect for the victims isn't the answer. You think the families from Oak Grove, Virginia Tech, Tucson, Aurora, Charleston, Orlando, we can go there, but you can also go to... So prayer is not the answer. Keeping quiet out of respect for the victims isn't the answer. While rehearsing for the new play Church and State, actor Rob Nagel was looking for the way North Carolina Senator Charles Whitmore might speak after attending funerals for children killed in a mass shooting in his hometown. He believes in his state, he believes in his country, he believes in family. He lost his father when he was young a young boy when he was six years old and grew up with a mama, strong mama and brothers uh, who all worked their way into politics as well. He cares a lot for his job, cares a lot for the people of his state uh, and he believes very strongly in his platform and then certain events throw that all into the the mix-up upside-down machine. The playwright Jason Odell Williams says Senator Whitmore is a Republican running for another term, but he starts to question God and the Second Amendment even though it's only three days before the election. Williams says he started thinking about writing the play after the shootings at Virginia Tech, then Tucson where Gabby Giffords was shot in the head, and then Sandy Hook where a gunman killed six adult employees and 20 children in an elementary school. That was the inspiration. Um, it was the sort of the ramping up of gun violence and mass shootings and seeing how our politicians were and were not dealing with it. Church and State earned three Ovation Award nominations when it was produced in Los Angeles. Rob has honed the character further by working with this director, Marcus Potter. The good book says a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So my work begins right now. Good, good. And now, now, now try the version where you are, the goal is to truly inspire, to wake sure, people up. Sure. And I need you to help make that change, to speak out with your vote. His wife really believes in Jesus, and she has come up with the uh, slogan, Jesus as my running mate. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he's starting to question it. That's a pretty huge deal in their marriage. But still, she seems crazy in love with him. 
Yes, at the end of the day, there's always a deep, deep love between them. In spite of the serious subject matter, the play has a lot of humor, much of it centered around Sarah. Sarah Whitmore is uh, a whole lot of fun. Uh, Sarah is a southern, not a southern belle, but a, uh, a southern brassy woman. She's got balls, if I can say that, on TV. Um, she's a mom, has, they have two boys. Her faith is very important to her, and when Charlie starts to sort of have doubts, uh, that is a sort of a game changer for her. But she's, uh, she's full of spunk and spirit and maybe the heart of the humor in this play. She's very likable. She is very likable. Social media provides quite a few laughs. Charlie and Sarah are a little bit of uh, not technically savvy. And Alex, of course, the campaign manager, is trying to get him to understand how Twitter works, or as he calls it, the Twitter. What is the audience reaction to Senator Whitmore? I liken him to somebody like um, maybe a Bob Dole or a Mitt Romney or, I don't know, more like a Republican that you would see in the 80s. Uh, and it's interesting, when we've done this play, people have seen it very in blue places like uh, Rochester, New York, and Los Angeles. They say, I would vote for that guy, even though he's a Republican. He's right in the middle. Beautiful man. The producer of the play at New World Stages is Charlotte Cohn, who happens to be married to the playwright and has produced and starred in some of his other work. She also served five years in the Israeli army. I had an M16, I had a Beretta. I operated them both. Um, I know firsthand what it's like to use a gun and what it does in a human environment as opposed to hunting. I read this play right after he wrote it, which was uh, shortly after Sandy Hook. And I said, I don't want to produce anymore. But it floored me how passionate it was, how important it is to bring it to the stage. And I thought, well, I know how to do this, so let's go. And several of those involved want to take the play on the road in hopes of getting people in many places to talk about reducing gun violence. My ultimate goal is to bring it to all the red states. Uh, we are in conversations with several theaters down in North Carolina and Virginia and Texas. It asks the question, can a human being change? A human being that's entrenched in a specific way of thinking. Every soul can make a difference. It just takes a little courage, a little caring, and a whole lot of follow through. I'm Charles Whitmore and I sure as hell approve this message. So with politics roiling the United States and issues like gun violence, partisanship, and Twitter in government taking center stage, so to speak, Church and State is a must-see. It's got humor and heart. It's a play for our times. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. Sometimes the biggest challenge for an artist is not so much creating the work, but finding a place to do it in. In this month's Hidden Gem, we'll introduce you to some pretty resourceful artists who found some pretty great, affordable spaces. Tina Beth Pina explains. You might say that property owners of this pre-war Harlem apartment complex are culturally inclined for allowing several artists to occupy the basement, and you'd be correct. My name is Duhirdwe Rushameza, and I'm an artist originally from Rwanda, and I work here at 601 Studios with six other amazing artists. Duhirwe finds that despite sharing space, she is able to maintain separate studio space where her inspiration can flow free. What inspires me is really almost everything. I, I mean, I can get inspiration from seeing a woman's really lovely geometric dress. Um, I like to, to really focus a lot on uh, layers and uh, this uh, geometric abstraction. Duhirwe creates multimedia pieces often using concrete as a base with found objects fixed to the surface, resulting in a kind of sculptural work. What we're looking at here is an oil painting that it also uh, includes collage. And, um, and what I do is I sort of like create a little window so then you can see into the piece and then cover it with resin. This mobile sculpture by another creative mind at 601 Studios alerts all that this is clearly a home to artists in residence. Meanwhile, downtown, at the corner of Rector and West Streets, artists share space and a gallery known as 50 West. This is where Bahar Bebahani paints the world around her as she sees it every day. A Brooklynite 
Bahar creates her work in close proximity to others, with studios occupying space in a condominium tower developed by Time Equities Incorporated. This generous space allows Bahar to think large as she envisioned her acclaimed series paying homage to the Persian gardens of her homeland. With gentrification and rising rents, artists are hard-pressed to find suitable loft space in Manhattan. They've learned that by pooling their resources and sharing space, whether it's uptown or downtown, determined painters and sculptors will find a way to pursue their dreams. I'm Tina Beth Pina for Arts in the City. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, go to cuny.tv. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, and we'll see you next time on Arts in the City.